Hello and welcome to the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Friends. My name is Leon Wolf and I am your host and we are glad that you have decided to join us. Today is Thursday, December the 3rd of 2015. We are <coughs> going to introduce our panel of guests and I want to thank all of them for their time for joining me tonight. Our regular panelists, we have Neil Dewing of The Federalist, uh, here fresh back from New Orleans, glad that he's able to join us and still barely conscious. Yeah, Health not quite Moore. fresh. Not, not, not so fresh. F. Bill McMorris of the Washington Free Beacon. Uh, glad, as always, that he is with us. Jeff Blair of the Ace of Spades Decision Desk. Always glad to have Jeff with us as well. And for our guest panelists, we have a dual threat tonight. Two for the price of one. Uh, the price I paid being zero. Uh, we have Mark and Molly Hemingway coming to us. Uh, Mark, of course, from the Weekly Standard, and Molly from the Federalist. Glad to have both of you guys with us. And we're going to start with you guys as we go right into the news of the day. We always go to our guest first with the first question. So we want to talk a little bit about the San Bernardino shootings. Of course, that's kind of the issue that's been dominating the news over the last couple of days. And, you know, if we can just kind of synthesize for our watchers now, I think as we set the table for those who might be watching it two or three days from now, what we know as of now is that the shooter, uh, Farouk, uh, was a United States citizen uh, who was here. His, his wife was here. She came on a valid K-1 visa, which is known as a fiancé visa, colloquially. So, so they're both legally in the country. She's from Pakistan. We know as of now that he has traveled out of the country through at least Saudi Arabia and Pakistan. We don't know exactly where all he was, he went on his overseas trip. Returned to the United States in July of 2014. At some point the FBI believes that he was radicalized. He was in contact with um, some known terror suspects over in Saudi Arabia over the last few months. There's some dispute about how recent those contacts were, how high level the contacts were, uh, uh, what the significance of that specifically is. Um, but we know now from the, from the press conference that the police had a few hours ago that when they went and, and raided the man's house, they found several thousand rounds of ammunition of various calibers, uh, numerous materials to create explosive devices, um, at least a dozen already assembled, kind of crude explosive devices, pipe bombs, and other things of that nature, and evidence of, of basically a highly planned attack. So that's what we know as of now. We still don't understand a motive. We don't have anything definite in terms of that, understanding why he went after this particular target. And so, you know, I, I guess that's where I'm going to start off with you guys. And I know it's, it's kind of irresponsible in a lot of ways to, 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 to make guesses about this, but with the caveat that it is a guess. What, what even could possibly be the excuse for why this particular place would be a, a, a viable target if we assume that this was as well-organized of attack as it seems to have been? Well, <laughs> I think that the average jihadi you know, is, has been radicalized precisely because maybe they aren't always the most candid star in the intellectual Milky Way. Uh, and so in, on, on that level, speculating about the precise nature of their motives, whether they're you know, mentally predisposed to radicalize, being radicalized or just not bright to begin with, uh, is, is something of a futile exercise. What I do find interesting is that there, you know, the the caution which the media is is treating all the available facts. There was a Washington Post story just this afternoon saying, "Whoa, whoa, whoa! The FBI has not definitively said this guy's been radicalized, despite all the other evidence uh, involving uh, terror contacts and other things like that." You know, meanwhile, within 15 minutes of the shooting, Bloomberg is tweeting out that, "Oh, by the way, this is two miles from an abortion clinic." So it tells you a lot about uh, the media and uh, um, that. You know, they when they choose to irresponsibly speculate and when they're urging caution. I would I was thinking the same thing. I actually, as a journalist, I do think it's wise to wait and really get your facts straight before you start speculating. And of course, people want to know exactly what's going on right away. And the disparity in how you saw that play out in Colorado before people even understood how close to the Planned Parenthood the shooting was taking place and how immediately it, it was not just about where it was taking place but they were pretty sure that it was undercover videos that had led this person to uh, commit this rampage I mean there was that was immediate I it was type of terrorism. You also have signs that aren't pointing to it, like just even something as simple as usually Muslim terrorists 
have some type of profession of faith when they are carrying out their terrorism. And I don't think anyone reported that in this case. Nobody said, oh, I heard him say, um, you know, a typical... Alu Akbar. Right. And, uh, and so it is, it is something that's it's worth it to go ahead and... You know, there's no need to rush. There's no need to speculate. But on the other hand, we do have information that the individual was radicalized and there are lots of the typical things you might see for someone who's committing a terror attack. But the target is so weird to me. A county government? I mean, who... It's just... It's, it seems well, like there are, there are a thousand I, better targets. How much experience have you had with local government? I mean, yeah, yeah, well, that's true. That's a, you know, if, if it was the DMV, I think we would all understand a little better. But let's go to, let's go to Bill. Um, and we're, we're getting kind of some more information that's leaking out kind of by the minute. One of the things that was, that was very early on reported was this supposed altercation that had happened at the holiday party um, at the county office. And one of the things that came out today on the news is that the specifics of the altercation involved, there was one of the guy's Jewish co-workers was allegedly having a dispute with him about, of all things, whether Islam was a violent religion. And that seems to have been possibly the thing that t targeted this guy to we'll say ironically, uh, go home and grab a bunch of automatic weapons and, and explosive devices and come back to his work. Uh, here's, here's what it, it strikes me. If, if you look at everything that was done, at the level of planning that was involved and kind of the bizarreness of the target, and I'm going to ask what you think of this idea, because I've heard it floated kind of in it obliquely before, but I want to see what you think about it. What do you think about the idea that maybe their ultimate target was originally supposed to be something else in downtown, maybe in downtown Los Angeles, some major high-value Staples Center, whatever, and the guy got pissed off at something that happened at work, and they decided to make a stop at his work before going on to whatever their ultimate target was. Does that seem like a plausible scenario to you? That does seem like a plausible scenario, uh, albeit with one, I think, pretty important caveat, and that's the fact that they actually ditched one of their rifles when uh, at the scene when they were fleeing. Uh, so if, if you look at uh, the route they took and where they were ultimately apprehended and killed, it seemed like they were going back home. It seems like they weren't... Like, this you know, might not have been a very well-planned diversion from what the real plan might have been. Yes, exactly. Y y if this was the direct... Uh, target uh, rather than a spontaneous target. They, you would think they would have brought their pipe bombs, but they did not bring the pipe bombs. They left the pipe bombs at home. And uh, if if I'm carrying out a terror attack, and you know, Lord willing, someday I will, um, then <laughs> if I'm if I'm doing that, then you know, I'm going to bring my pipe bomb to my machine gun fight. You know, you don't leave those pipe bombs at home. That's going to be an asset. And it seems like they, they brought, what, one device with them and left their entire stockpile at their house. That's the, the one thing I think that lends credence to this claim, that this was a more spontaneous uh, event, albeit fueled by the same ideology and the same hatred to begin with. Go ahead, Molly. Two things. One, I do think it's interesting that they went back to their house, so maybe they thought this could be a multi-day right. operation or something that they would somehow be able to do. Kind of but similar also, to it does, Paris, that they were trying to accomplish something like what happened in Paris. Yeah, and also, though, it does seem like maybe there are more people involved than two, and the stuff, you know, it seems like they had enough rounds of ammunition for really quite a few more people, and I was just reading something that said that there had been contact that made people think there might be some type of network of people involved. But it is, doesn't seem to have the, doesn't seem to have the great level of, it, it was obviously a well thought out operation in certain regards. I mean, they, they did kill quite a few people, but in other ways it seems like they could have maximized their potential, their See, terrorism I, potential better. I, I just want to add, remember the good old days when the worst thing that happened at your office holiday party was people got drunk and tried to photocopy their ass? That's yeah. <laughs> really, really. That was the worst thing. I thought that was the best thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The highlight of the party, right there. Well, the a best feature. On the Fe on see, the photo can, can I say uh, one thing about uh, this that is confusing to me, and I think um, you know, kind of demonstrably shows that it wasn't a a piece of workplace violence. If you are going out carrying out a, you know, shooting up your office, you want the individuals that you're punishing 
to know who you are. You don't show up with a mask. And, you know, I could see that they wanted to kill their coworkers because they, you know, disagreed about the violent nature of the Muslim faith. I could see why they would do that. But at the same time, you know, he went and he did kill the guy who was slandering, uh, in his mind, Islam, but he was wearing a mask when he did it. Um, so, I, I mean, you know, the postal service workers that would go berserk and shoot up their offices, they never wore masks. They wanted their coworkers to know that I am the one that's doing this to you. Yeah, so we're gonna, yeah. that, that's one interesting thing. Leon, yeah, uh, we're gonna go to we're gonna go to you, Jeff, and I just want to I just want to interject that it, it seems to me, and and you know you can respond to the, to to this if you want. It seems to me that what it looks like is that Al Qaeda or ISIS or some foreign group recruited these people somehow, um, but did a relatively half-assed job of them. I mean, I think this is what you see as a result of this guy having basically grown up in America and latched on to this within the last six months. He's a millennial, and millennials can't do anything. That's right. They, they're, yeah. they're terrible. They, they, really, they really do fail at all things. I agree. But, I mean, is, is that, I mean, that's kind of a lot of the, a lot of the reasons that you see uh, the things like you, you don't have the profession of faith. You have this kind of unprofessional, it looks like kind of flying off the handle in rage at his coworkers as opposed to going at what might be a, a sensible target is a guy who hasn't been steeped all his life in, in, in the training and discipline of this, but is, is, is a recent that somebody that they kind of latched onto and said, yeah, go sure do your thing. Yeah, well, I mean, here's the thing. Of course, we are still early days here, so we, we, don't, not, we don't know enough or anything really about um, what we can say, whether this is an actual act of ISIS recruitment or whether it was self-radicalization. And I will tell you right now, for my part, it's just a hunch, and hunches, of course, aren't based on evidence. They aren't based on anything. But I just, from you know, all the things that I can say, this this looks to me look a lot more like a Nidal, Hassan sort of self-radicalization situation, uh, even though he was in contact with people, um, than an actual ISIS or Al Qaeda, you know, coordination situation. And for all the reasons that you just mentioned, that the amateurishness of it, the fact that the target was his workplace, where I don't know. This guy clearly seemed to have some sort of beef with people who he was, you know, upset with at his office. Um, but any, any. You well, know, I guess, I guess my rejoinder to that would be, where, I mean, AR-15s or AKs or whatever he had are not cheap. Um, no, no, absolutely how did he, not. How did he? How would? How did he, on a county worker salary, afford two of them plus two handguns plus all the ammunition which they listed, which would not have been cheap? Plus, you know, wait, 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 Leon, Leon, Leon. That's not hard at all. Okay, here, here's here's your simple answer. You put it on credit answer. cards too. Yeah, exactly. You know, Molly just answered it for me. You put it on credit cards, when, and it's easy to put anything on a credit card when you know your your life expectancy is measured in days. So who the hell cares? Okay. Uh, furthermore, you're living in San Bernardino. Okay, this is not you know Ventura County. This is not Los Angeles County. This is pretty cheap. This is Inland Empire, California. You can have a house, a mortgage, whatever all that other stuff is, and still have leftover money for this sort of thing. But what I find to be much more telling is the fact that uh, you know, the guns that he bought, expensive though they may have been, are also sort of the the badges and the icons of Islamic and Muslim Islamist terrorism. So it was natural that anybody who was inspired to use that as a motive would pick up those items to do that work. <coughs> That to me tells me nothing. What tells me something is the half-assed way in which you did it. Not in the half-assed execution. I mean, 14 people died. Another 14 to 17 people were injured. God only knows what will happen to them. This was serious. But the weird, the weird mixture of planning and not planning, and not really having any end game or any strategy, including like just a you know a desire to die outright, which is the way the Bataclan terrorists, uh, the the French terrorists came in with it. They they expected to die, uh, and you know well, if if they I, were going to go out there. Well, we haven't heard from Neil yet, but but if I yeah, but I mean, but, one but of, I'm saying is that I'm saying I think this is self radicalization is all. If I, if I can interject one objection to what you're saying, one of the key sure. facts that came out today that mitigates against this being an Adal Hassan, these people just radicalized themselves and went off is the fact that as the San Bernardino sheriff said today, the two long rifles, the AR-15s or whatever they are, were not purchased by Farouk. We don't mm -hmm. know. They're not releasing the names of the person who purchased them. Straw purchases, yeah. right. Yeah, yeah somebody, somebody engaged in a straw purchase of the two most expensive pieces of equipment in this operation and gave them to Farouk, which 
uh, again, it kind of mitigates to me against the theory that they ran up a bunch of money on their credit cards for all this stuff, knowing that they were going out in a blaze of glory by themselves. But Neil, it, it, it really, it really, could, it really straw could purchases. What what are we going to? How embarrassed are we going to be when we find out that it was uh, the ATF that supplied these weapons? I know. I was. <laughs> <laughs> That's it was fast and furious, right? That's yeah. how they got them. Yeah. Talk about your all time backfires. You know what? I I, yeah. I just want to keep talking so Neil doesn't get a chance to talk all show. <laughs> he's just standing, like Matt he's just Damon. That look on his face. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, well, with that uh, haircut, he doesn't deserve to talk. I right. So Neil, Martin Fink over here. So Neil, one of the things. Look, we the initial report <laughs> on this story, which included this guy getting mad at his holiday party and coming back and shooting it up, kind of indicated that this was another one of this is just a crazy person going in and shooting up a public place again. And so, of course, we have media and the Democrats uh, coming out with their usual narrative, which is, you know, gosh, we've got to have, you know, restrictions to keep crazy people from getting guns. What's interesting to me is that now that it seems increasingly clear that that was not the case, that, that we have, you know, some sort of coordinated ideology-driven attack here, they're still, they have no shame and no willingness to back off or change the narrative. In fact, they're only intensifying it. And uh, I guess my question is, is, they're clearly banking on the idea that this is eventually going to work. It's not working so far. And, and in fact, I wrote a post on this about four or five weeks ago. They've actually moved the needle in the wrong way. Gallup has been polling for years. Do you think it's too easy in America to buy a gun? So uh, from 1989 all the way through like August of 2015, a majority of Americans said yes. After uh, The August 2015 poll was the first time in the history of the poll that Americans, more than 50% said no, it's not too easy in America to buy the gun. So they're moving backwards. And there's been five consecutive months now of record gun sales in the United States. Eventually, though, they think they're going to win. And I guess my, my, my question to you is, do you think that uh, eventually they will succeed, that this, this constant drumbeat, uh, like it has with so many other issues of, of just public you know, hammering on the issue uh, again and again with the media in the tank on it, is going to move the needle on this? No, I don't think it'll work. Um, you know, never underestimate the uh, the uh, power that they have uh, with uh, you know the control of the media. You know, they they really do still occupy the legitimate media in the minds of um, most of America. And so, when they repeat falsehoods right out of the gate, those things become the um, conventional wisdom, which is why people are still referring to Colorado as the Planned Parenthood shooting, despite, at least as far as I know, because um, I've been drunk in New Orleans for three days, there's still been no motive released for that attack. But they keep repeating it and repeating it and repeating it, and eventually we get tired of checking their facts. We slip up, we let them have the floor, and then, bam. There you go. So, um, yeah, well, that's essentially what I'm advocating here is in the long run, everything is uh, doomed to dust and ashes, and there's no point getting worked up about it. But I don't think that they will be successful with um, banning guns or making gun sales uh, more restrictive. What I think they ought to do is be honest with the American people and start a campaign to repeal the Second Amendment. <laughs> Until they do that, we cannot in any way believe that they are serious about ending gun violence in the United States of America. So I would challenge all of our liberal and leftist viewers, start a group, pack, organize in your community, repeal the Second, do it, try, please. They're, they're basically there. Uh, Zach Beauchamp of uh, the uh, Bridge to Gaza fame, uh, Vox.com, just wrote a column for the week where he argues in favor of repealing the Second Amendment. I mean, <laughs> I, I think that, I mean... I commend it, him. I it, commend it, him for his it, honesty and his forthright approach to the issues. It defies all logic, but they're there. What I, I just don't get is... is, is I, 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 there are things that we could talk about that I think people generally agree on, mental illness and some other things that would possibly help with, with gun deaths. I, I mean, 
I, I think part of this is about trying to legislate away human nature, which is you know never going to happen. Exactly. Uh, in Japan, you have to uh, register your ceremonial swords with the police. And in 2008, they had a guy drive into a crowd, hop out, and stab like a dozen people, killing several of them. I mean, I, I, the efficacy of this is obviously you know not going to work out for them, uh, but it's just. Actually, can I say, they, go ahead. I don't really understand why we're talking about gun control. It's such an obvious, uh, it's like a distraction that, that liberal journalists are throwing out there because they don't want to talk about what happened in San Bernardino for real. So they're talking about gun control as a way of protecting themselves from having those conversations that they don't want to have. And I'm just wondering why people are really going along with it. Like, I, I just, it's, 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 like, no, there's when no someone, answer. It's, when it's someone says, stop. like, Gun control, you just go, you're not being a serious person. You need to be a serious person now. There's a lot of truth to that, but but I, I don't I don't think that that's entirely it. I mean, I think that these are people that, like, really believe their own delusions uh, yeah, in that regard. Yeah. And it's, it's just, painfully true to me because, I mean, and it's been jarring to me because I've watched the news, like, all day. I mean, that's, you know, part of my – main part of my job is, like, I keep the news on in the background. Normally – just to be perfectly honest, just to add to my credentials, everyone out there thinks that I'm a crypto democrat. I find Fox News totally unwatchable. I, that's just I can't I can't handle it. No offense to anybody here who's on Fox News. I'm sorry if I've ruined your television career because I know they don't handle criticism well. But but under normal, I mean, it's just it's so just just schlocky. I, I could have said Eric Bolton the other day. I'm done. Man. Yeah, right. Um, so I normally I watch CNN, and today I couldn't. I couldn't stay with it for more than 10 minutes because it's just so – like Fox News today, to their credit, has been reporting facts. Like there have been a lot of – they've been on news conferences. They've been talking to witnesses. They've been – I mean every time I've turned them on, they've had reporters on the ground covering something that is actually occurring with the, with connection with this shooting. CNN and MSNBC, every time I turn them on, they're, 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 they're preaching about um, you know gun control or, or, or dealing with stuff that has nothing to do with the actual facts of the story. And it's it's it, it's been jarring to me the extent to which the networks are not even covering the same story. But I want to I want to stay. It's easier than admitting that we don't have a solution. There's no solution to this problem. Yeah. It's not going away as long as we allow people the freedom, the liberty to own firearms. It's not going away, and they Wait, can't so are, deal with that. So are are you admitting that uh, you do not? have a solution to the fallen nature of man? Is, th is that what you're saying? Because the left does, and it just involves confiscating all of the I, I am afraid to say that no, I do not have a solution to that. I, I just want to really. say... Uh, Jesus, the, right? That's what I was going to say too, Mark. I know a lot of people. Think <laughs> I, I was I, I, I wasn't going to say Jesus, but I, I again just want to point out the the irony in the last week or so of students rising up to protest Woodrow Wilson. Uh, I mean, he is the source literally of all of this. This whole entire liberal notion that you can transcend human nature, and yet they're demanding that he be like basically removed from the history books. I mean, it is hilarious. Uh, that, that this is where we're at. But I mean, again, every one of these debates revolves around a fundamental misunderstanding of human nature. And like, it doesn't even necessarily have to be a dogmatically religious one. It just simply has to acknowledge that human beings are inherently self-interested creatures. And people had no problem acknowledging that in a secular context right up until the late 19th century. And then all of a sudden, like, you know, everything's gone cattywampus and nobody has any explanation for it. It's just like so incredibly frustrating to wake up every day and argue over the same basic observable fact of human nature every day. Well there is there is something to this and, and we'll go uh, we'll go again to, to Bill here. There is something and I did some research on this today because I was watching CNN briefly again and Fareed Zakaria said an insane thing which was that Europe has 120th to 125th of the violence that we do have here in America. And that's just that's asinine. It's not true. It's absolutely not true. What is true what is true is that America tends to have homicide rates that are between two and five times higher than most European countries. Uh, the one country that we have the highest disparity with is Iceland. Now, this the Iceland, I think, presents an interesting study because you can have guns in Iceland. Police carry guns in Iceland, and Iceland's been a country since 1947. Granted, they only have, what, 300,000 people there? But that's, that's a, a relatively major United States city. Police carry guns. They've been a country since 1947. They just last year had their first, first ever cop shooting an Icelandic citizen. They had the lowest murder rate in the world. I think we have to just acknowledge the fact 
that Americans are probably different. I mean, we're probably a little more habitually aggressive, and part of that is why the has an world inc- calls us to pull their butts out of the fire every time, you know, so, some something goes wrong in the in in the Middle East or some violent place in the world. We're the only ones capable of doing it by constitution. But well, uh, do you think there's one of the thing, one of the things, Leon? One of the things that's also worth acknowledging that it's uncomfortable, but it's true, is that Iceland has a thoroughly homogenous population. Yeah. It's exactly everybody what I was in everybody say. in Iceland. Everybody in Iceland is a filthy, dirty Scandi. Okay, they're, right. They're, they're they're the horrible, like you know, bastard offshoot of the Vikings. The worst of the worst. But they're all the same kind of people. Okay. There is no sort well, they're not meaningful. Racial, from, from, yeah, from racial I, heterodoxy or cultural heterodoxy in Iceland. Well, then the, even the, in Sweden, the men even look just Sw- like the women. But so, I was gonna, like, that's yeah. how androgynous it all is. You know, <laughs> everyone in Iceland is is the same. You have hot. I, 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 Iceland is I Iceland is such an Iceland. Just Iceland, Iceland cold Iceland. there. I, but, I, but here's the thing. No, no, no. Kidding aside, Iceland is such an <laughs> isolated culture that their their language is still understandable. Their medieval and you know early medieval language is still understandable to modern speakers because they've been so set aside from the rest of European culture that they haven't changed. And when you have that kind of a culture, even other Scandinavian countries, Norway, Sweden, Sweden in particular, that has a lot of uh, you know Islamic and uh, you know you know foreign refugees, has significant problems with cultural violence. Which is not any sort of racial comment, but is is a comment about cultural heterodoxy, and is sort of I think you know one of a side effect of one of the greatest qualities of the United States, which is that we are the melting pot. We are everyone. We have every conceivable culture comes to this land. They hopefully assimilate. Sometimes they don't entirely. They form their own cultural enclaves. But that is when you have people separating themselves like that. Um, for whatever reasons, whether historical or cultural or otherwise, or even racism, you know, you can argue that that plays a role too. Uh, you're going to get more racist. You're going to get more violence. And so, like, you know, you, to, to contrast, well, what's interesting, the European what's interesting? violence is, is the thing that pisses me off the most about people who quote European stats versus ours. Because you go look at a place like France on a per capita level, France or England, their violence. Not gun violence, you know, shooting in the head, murder right. violence, but their actual violence numbers are fairly comparable. Okay. Well, England's is actually, and I looked this up as well. So, in total rates, crimes, right. total crimes for a thousand people is over three times higher than the United States. Yeah. France is about. Yeah, 50% but, but a lot of that is property crime. A lot, uh, you know, which comes with the territory of having an, an armed populace. But, but and now, a lot of it's mugging and stuff. I mean, yeah. you look at Spain. There's That's a the mugger trigger. on every street corner because. And, and, and you know what, there is something to be said about that. You know, I you you know one of my biggest pet peeves is we don't have enough fist fights anymore. So right. maybe the European brand of violence is more fun. At least it's, well, it's more honest. We're, this, we're actually more egalitarian. We give women a fighting chance here in the U.S. Well, which this is we where, just don't enjoy over there. This is where the impact of, of widespread firearm ownership actually is is positive, and, and people don't talk about this. I mean, they've done studies, for instance, and they found that like British criminals spend. They found that British criminals spend something like three times as long casing a burglary operation as American criminals because American, uh, I'm sorry, American criminals spend three times as long as British criminals. I'm sorry, because American criminals know that if they break into the house when the when the owner is there, the odds of them getting shot are really really high. So obviously the, the barrier to crime is much much. Um, uh, lower if you know that people don't own guns. And, and, and America actually benefits, I think, in terms of reducing overall violent crime. But to, but to jump in and, and on what Jeff said, I, I was going to say the same thing he said about diversity, uh, um, uh, but again, and but which is absolutely on point, but it's worth mentioning that this is, again, another liberal paradox. Liberals want us to embrace diversity. The problem is you have a big country with lots of diverse cultures, lots of diverse people of different status and income and everything like this. Uh, it create, Diversity by nature creates conflict, and conflict creates problems. Uh, you know, liberals always argue that more diversity is a good thing. Well, I'm not saying we don't embrace people and, and try and be, you know, the melting pot that America should be. Absolutely, we should. But you also have to understand if you're going to be the country that assimilates all these people, you're going to have to deal with the consequences. And I think the American uh, um, constitutional system has done an unbelievably amazing job of managing conflict culturally uh, and, and in terms of violence, uh, given what we're working with. 
Literally, well, we've done a better job historically than any in the other. Middle East, for instance, to cultural mm -hmm. conflict here. I mean, um, there's or 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 in, uh, or in Africa as well, where they arbitrarily redrew borders without accounting for tribes that hated each other that might have lived, you know, a stone's throw from one another for a thousand years. Mm -hmm. You know, here we can make it work because precisely because of what Marx said, we have this constitutional system and everybody is equal under the law, um, and other regions of the world are not nearly so fortunate so we actually are doing pretty good in the you know cosmic scheme of things except we've never done a better job historically than any other country in the history of the modern era maybe I would not like the to old maybe not the old ottoman empire or something think, like that I but think, in the modern era i think that there is i think that then i'm going to let i'm going to let molly talk here i think that there is something to be said for the uniqueness of the american character I think having having you know just encountered you know different people, I think that we are, I think that a lot of people and Europeans in particular are a little, a little taken aback by how kind of forward and aggressive Americans are about a lot of things. But I, I do think that you find that, uh, and, and, I, and I did this. I don't I don't have time to like plot it in a in a neat chart to do extensive research. It's not a perfect correlation, but basically you trade about 20 homicides per million people for about 10,000 total crimes per million people. So as your murder rate goes up, your, your total... So Iceland, for instance, we talk about how astronomically low their murder rate is. They have the highest total crime rate in the entire world by almost double their nearest competitor. I mean, it's, it's humongous, the amount of total crime that they have. So I don't know what, for whatever that is worth. But Molly, what were you going to go ahead and say? Well, I, you know, I do think it's really important to have a good understanding of actual crime rates, and they've been so much on the decline in this country, and that's something that doesn't get talked about. I'm kind of curious how it relates to whether crime rates have also gone down in, in other countries, European countries or otherwise. <laughs> but having said that, I think that there is a really weird, obvious problem where you're having more and more mass shootings. They're usually done by alienated young men. And they are, they they are on the rise. Mass shootings are on the rise, even as other gun violence is down. And I, I think that's something that people don't understand why it's happening. And I think it's a big problem. And that it's probably a really complex, weird, you know, combination of things. But it's also not just in terms of mass shootings, but suicides seem to be a big problem. Again, particularly for men. In this case, particularly for like white middle-aged men. And I don't know why, but I also think it's not wise to pretend it's not happening. Uh, most gun violence actually is suicide, and it's probably touched many of our families. Um, and there is something about guns that makes it easier to commit suicide. Um, I don't know if there have been studies showing whether it actually changes how many people do commit suicide. But, you know, these are real problems. They're real things. They're part of the American character. I think we're seeing some type of social changes that are alienating people from family life, from communities and whatnot, and that we would be wise to pay a lot of attention to that. I would point out that in terms of a media phenomenon, uh, in terms of the phenomenon of mass shootings, the media bears some blame here. I mean, there's all sorts of studies that show that, for instance, the media coverage of these lone wolf killers and stuff, I mean, it's the, exactly the kind of immortality that they're seeking, and it begats more of these things. There is really good stuff on this by Barton Swaim, is that it? Yeah. Um, and, and in and I, Atlantis that is really troubling, because, it. I mean, I, you know, you don't want to say you don't cover a shooting, but it's also true that it almost come, becomes like this epidemiological problem where it spreads because the media are paying attention to it. Right, and I, and I think that I, and I, and I, I, at the risk of my career, I do have to agree with, with Bill on, on a very important point that he's made. And I made this about an article that I saw earlier this week where somebody asked, why aren't there as many violent acts at abortion clinics overseas as there are in America? Which we actually, again, um, George Tiller is the only actual abortion provider who's been killed in America in the last century. But, you know, if you count the arsons and the vandalism and so on and so forth, part of that is, yeah, abortion is more accepted in Europe, but I think a, an equally major part of it is that people are allowed to participate in the democratic process with respect to abortion regulation in Europe. So people feel like they have a say. So, you know, if you have Wait, a belief that a given there, re restriction, a you know, should be put into place... You know, you can. Th that's part of the political process in a lot of countries in Europe. Is that the parliament can vote on these things? There's also Whereas the fact the that abortion laws are so much more radical here in this country than anywhere else oh, in the world. For the yeah, it's, uh, it's China and North Korea. 
Yeah, which I mean, is I mean, North Korea. Really bad company is, on this. Do, uh, do, you, do you mean abortion laws, Molly, or do you mean abortion rulings? Because I think no. abortion laws are far more extreme or strict in European countries. Yes. But no, we have we have non-legislative solutions. No, no, that's here, what I'm saying. Like, in, in, the problem. in France, you know, I think it's like limited at 12 huh. weeks or something like that. Here, it's yep. you know, you can you can basically get an abortion through all nine months of pregnancy if you know depending on where you are and whatnot no but but leon has a point is that, no is point. that Ro, roe v wade cut off debate that's what leon was yeah that's what i'm saying leon has a point roe v wade cut off debate and therefore people feel the only way to express themselves is through is outside the system in ways that are bad right so so people feel in, in overwhelming numbers that, that certain restrictions on abortion should be put into place no abortions in the third trimester no abortions in you know you get parental consent for anybody under 18 you know uh, so and you go on down the line there are restrictions that are supported by 75 80 percent of people state legislatures pass them in again and again and again they get struck down by the courts so you have this this frustration where people feel like my gosh no matter who I vote for no matter what I do to participate in the political process is not going to do any good, and I think that it begets at least part of it. And I think that what Bill has said, I don't know how serious he's been about this a number of times in the show, but I think it's a valid point. Look, there used to be a lot of disagreements and fights, and my gosh, we we go even to the movie Friday here. You know, the closing scene. You used to settle your fights um, with your fists. I mean, that used to be the way that you know when people, when somebody would say something insulting to somebody else, it was socially acceptable. A guy got his lights punched out. He got up. He went back to work. Everybody the next day, I think, was better for it. That has become a thing now where that gets you thrown in jail and sued for all your money. And... Yeah, whoever wins goes to prison or gets sued. It's ridiculous. Yep. Uh, although the best point that's been made thus far was from uh, viewer Benjamin Glazer, who pointed out that all the violent, aggressive Europeans were killed between 1914 and 1945. And because we're good at war, we still have our violent, aggressive people. So I, I, I think that's something that bears Bill, Bill, we, we had a lot of them out. killed between 1861 and 1865, to be fair. Okay? Yeah, that's that's why we imported the Irish. <laughs> no. <laughs> nice. All right. So I, I, I have a friend who uh, he works for a French satellite company, and he, he tells me that it's kind of remarkable because whatever your, the caricatures are of the French people, but the, the, the top level French executives, like, you know, the, the French one percenters, the, the, the rich French are like the most aggressive balls out, you know, unbelievable people you will ever run across. And I totally believe it. Now I'm, I'm sure that a certain percentage of the population has been, you know, uh, rendered docile by socialism, but I mean, let's not kid ourselves. I mean, people are still inherently interested, and just because France is a different system of government, uh, or you know, England is a different system of government, the Scottish or the French are somehow become less aggressive. I'm not sure that's the case. Yeah, I, and I think, well, France well, that's why the Donald Trump, Trump party is, is doing well hey. right now. In France. Oh yeah, Aaron. Leon. Leon, can I? Yeah, I'm on the show. Hey, look at that. Oh. Um, <laughs> <Hey. laughs> No, but, I kept wondering. Uh, let, let me let me just. Hey, Aaron, can we actually hear you before you start France talking? Tends, Aaron, yes. I'm gonna let you jump. France tends to swing wildly back and forth in their history between anarchy and totalitarianism in a way that maybe no other European country has, and and maybe we're seeing them swing back. I mean, with the next election expected to be between Le Pen and Sarkozy for first place, maybe we're seeing a little bit of pendulum swing the other way. Aaron, what do you got? Um, well, I, I was just going to comment one on on just kind of the cultural difference between uh, us and the rest of the world, and even here in uh, in America, we have cultural differences. For this last week, uh, before this Planned Parenthood, uh, the Planned Parenthood shootout thing happened here in Colorado Springs, um, my family from Vermont, my my wife's family actually from Vermont, my in laws, were all here, and uh, I had an opportunity to go shooting. Um, at this new uh, shooting range here in Colorado Springs called Magnum Shooting Center. And uh, not only did I get to go shoot in there for free because it was vet, uh, I'm a veteran and they were doing free shoots all month for veterans, I also got a, $5, a coupon for a $5 machine gun rental. And so I got to go down there and I got to uh, fire off a HK uh, uh, MP5 and full auto and, and all this stuff. And when I wow. came back and got to talk about it with my father-in-law, he was he was confused. He didn't really understand um, why I was so excited about that. He didn't get it at all. It, and even though he lives in Vermont, which has very you know few gun control laws and a whole lot of guns, 
He just didn't understand the whole concept. And then a few days later, we have this whole Colorado Springs event, and I was out there at the scene and everything. And uh, basically, I came back the next day, and uh, I, I basically talked to him a little bit more about why culturally out here in the West people want to have guns and, and why they want to be able to shoot things. And it's because – we didn't we're not like europe we're not like new england we're very very spread out i grew up on ranches and farms and things like that and you know having three policemen for an entire county size area yep. um it, yeah. isn't a strange thing out west so self-defense is something that we're not far separated from whereas europe europe is separated yeah. by centuries from self-defense they have no concept yeah. of it really so um we may see a greater occurrences uh, of, of shootings um, here and there for some reasons, but at the same time, we see more liberty and we see more individuals taking out bad guys in these situations than we do in other countries as well. So you gotta, you gotta take both sides of the coin and really weigh them out. But um, I had that to say on the, on the broader topic of all this, but I'm sure you want me to probably talk about Colorado a little bit as well. Yeah, and, and there, there is some evidence, and, and that's kind of what I was trying to get at in an oblique way earlier. There is some evidence that the, that the threat of death for potential criminals has a real effect on reducing the overall incidence of crime. And I think that there's a absolutely something to that. But Aaron, let's go, let's go talk about, let's move on and talk about the Colorado spring shooting that occurred earlier Friday, and you've got some pictures here, and this was this was fascinating to me. You know, you happened to tell us a little bit about how it came to be. Obviously, you you heard that this was maybe going on, and how you came to be down at the center, and you ended up being on on CNN, kind of as a live on the scene reporter there. Yeah, well, basically, what happened was um, the King Supers shopping. Uh, the King Shoopers shopping area right there uh, next to the Planned Parenthood and the Chase Bank and all those things. Um, that's the, the regular place that I go shopping at every single week uh, for my family. So I was actually there um, a little bit before the incident happened um, and got my groceries and stuff and was leaving. And I had left the area and was probably no more uh, – no more than two and a half miles away at the most when I saw it hit on Twitter. And um, so I, I was carrying, I didn't actually say this stuff on oh CNN, but I was carrying at the time. And um, so I turned around and I went back towards and pulled into a, a neighborhood that was no more than half a mile um, just down the road from where the Planned Parenthood was. And I actually started uh, going up through some deer trails. I know that uh, run back right to behind it. And I was heading up there, and as I was getting up there, I got uh, probably um, – I was probably anywhere between uh, a quarter mile and a half mile away when I heard a single shot ring out that to me sounded like a rifle. Um, it was snowing. You know, there was about three inches of snow on the ground where I was, and it was snowing at the time it was going on. So I couldn't tell for sure what it was just because of the noise being dampened. But at that point, I um, came down from the um, hills and back to my car. And uh, at that point, you can see this picture here. Um, that's what I came back to. That is a uh, two uh, Colorado Springs police uh, cruisers there. Uh, with one of the officers um, leaning over his hood uh, or leaning over the top of his vehicle with a uh, some sort of M4 variant um, police issue weapon uh, pointing up the hill towards the Planned Parenthood. Um, and then uh, after I came out from there, of course, I had to turn to the left, and then I made myself... Well, I don't suppose you, have, you know whether either of these are the officer who... who who was taken down in the course of this. No, no, no. And see, here's the thing is the, the, by the time I had turned around and everything, the active shooter, um, situation was already known. So officers were coming to the scene. These guys were, by the time I was coming back down, these guys were securing the perimeter, doing the cordon off area to not let traffic in any further. So I was basically having to leave at that point. Um, now, at, at that point, what I did is I ended up uh, taking a back route and getting around to the Fillmore side, the south side of where this was happening, and uh, got up with the first flood of the media um, when the police escorted us up 
to the uh, media staging area. And um, then the next day I went through and I, I, I did some photography out there. I'm going to go through these real, relatively quickly. Um, this is one of the first shots I got when uh, it opened up. If you can see here, what we have in, the, in this is a uh, police cruiser, um, Colorado Springs police cruiser. And you can see the back window. It's all white. And then you see the black part there. That black part there, that's not melted snow. That's where the back window got shot out. Now, directly in front of that, um, the building you see with the triangle tip there, that is the Planned Parenthood building right there. Now, uh, I'm going to go to another shot here, and this will show you that there was another police cruiser down the road from the black one with the window shot out, and um, that one is facing this one. And now, again, the black cruiser, that is right at the backside of, um, of the bank and um, the white cruiser is right on the front side of the Planned Parenthood parking lot there. So you can kind of get an idea from that where uh, Deer might have been when he started shooting at the two officers. Um, he, that, that looks to me like he, it, he may have been in between the bank and the Planned Parenthood at the time that the sh shooting started. Um, then uh, some more pictures from the scene when it happened. This was a, a lineup of ambulances that was uh, there waiting uh, for wow. victims once we were able, once they were able to go in uh, onto the scene there and secure them. Um, we also had ATF agents. Uh, the guy on the right side, I believe, of your screen there is ATF agent. Uh, the other one is a sheriff's department. Um, we also, while we were there, they they had the. Uh, regional explosives unit uh, on scene as well. So um, it was a pretty intense scene for a few days. Um, and this is the uh, closest we were able to get. I was able to get to the um, to the Planned Parenthood. And you can see the blue tarp there in the entryway was actually covering up what, uh, what uh, turned out to be the entry point that the police used with vehicles. They kind of crushed in the doors there uh, to enter and, and, and do it safely. So um, that's kind of the basics of, of the scene there um, at the 1300 block, or I'm sorry, at the Centennial Boulevard shooting. Um, but, uh, you know, there's some interesting things I want to, I want to note on this is that um, this guy he lives 60 miles away in a town called Hartzell, okay? And this is up in the mountains. Um, and, and actually, if you were to travel from, like, Vail to Colorado Springs, you would travel through South, South Park, the real South Park, and then uh, Hartzell, and then come down 20, or, uh, Highway 24 uh, heading west, or east, sorry, towards um, Colorado Springs. So he drove 60 miles um, from his uh, camper up in this, this isolated plains in the mountains, uh, high plains in the mountains, and he had no electricity in this camper. And he comes down this 60 miles, even though there was a Planned Parenthood that was closer to him in Salida, he comes down to the Colorado Springs Planned Parenthood, apparently, and goes into this uh, Planned Parenthood, shoots a few people outside of it, goes in, stays there for five and a half hours, and uh, doesn't shoot anybody while there. Um, and then upon coming out, he's reportedly said to have uh, said, um, no more baby parts. And... Uh, this all to me just seems a little too cute by half here because number one, why would he spend five and a half hours in a Planned Parenthood um, that he's targeting for this baby parts stuff and not shoot anybody while he's inside? Number two, where did he even hear no more baby parts and about the baby parts? Because the, the man had no electricity in this shack that he was living in. And, you know, number three, um, this uh, report of no more baby parts, it comes from this uh, Washington Post reporter, uh, Wesley Lowry, was the first person to pick it up and send it out right. uh, with uh, anonymous uh, police official uh, who spoke on the condition of an anonymity because it's an active pending investigation. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't I, just Aaron, 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 law enforcement. Yeah, I, I said law enforcement. I think it was Aaron, 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 because I understand fog of war, I understand how BS quickly spreads in these sorts of situations. Are you don't have you don't know? No one can know. None of us know. But do you suspect that this whole no more baby parts thing is basically just BS? 
or because I agree with you. I have literally everything you just said syncs with what I thought. It just sounds, as you said, a little bit too cute. Yeah, you know, well, too perfect. A okay. story too good to check. Let me then let me you... let me let me say this. Um, there's there's a couple different possibilities. Um, there's the possibility he said it for some reason. He picked it up somewhere and said it. Okay. Um, another possibility is that he. Uh, didn't say it and Wesley Lowry is just having another hands up don't shoot moment and right. um he's just a hack of a reporter. A third option and probably the most disturbing one is that uh he went in there um after shooting some people outside and spent five hours in there and maybe somebody there at Planned Parenthood told him to say it. Um I mean these are I, I would hate for Can that I suggest to be a the fourth option? Yeah, go ahead. Just a fourth option. The fourth option, which is close to your third one, is sort of a post hoc rationalization. It's like you know, this is the sort of thing that you pick up over the, you know osmosis in the ether. You know, you see, and if you're even if you're a right wing fanatic psychopath living out in the woods, you may get some of this stuff via osmosis oh. over time. Yeah, yeah. And if you've done this I think crazy that's shit, possible. Part of my I'm, language. Then you come out with that. You say that like as you're rambling about all your other reasons you did it. Oh, you know, I was unhappy. My wife left me. Nobody loves me. No more baby parts. You throw everything out there because you just shot like how many people, and you've been taken into right. custody by the police. Right. And, they're gonna, and, and the media is going to run with what the one that's the best media. Well, let me answer your question. Yeah, here. but but hold on. I there, there's there's also there's also uh, you know, and I don't I don't want to spin uh, a conspiracy theory on any of this or anything like that. But it it just all seems too convenient to me that not too. Two days before on November, or a few days before on November 25th, we have Narrell and a bunch of other people sending a letter to the Attorney General uh, agitating for any attacks near or on Planned Parenthood clinics to be de uh, designated domestic terror attacks. And I, I got that letter right here from, from uh, Narrell. And I mean the things that the things that they say in here. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna just read just a little portion of it. And it says, uh, as you know, beginning in July when the first video was released, uh, speaking about the uh, Center for Medical Proge Progress videos, when the first video was released and continuing through recent weeks, there have been multiple arson attacks and and an outrageous number of threats against abortion providers. It's clear that anti-choice extremists are using these videos as an excuse to commit violent acts against trusted women. Women's health clinics. We hate rhetoric, or when hate rhetoric and threats incite violence, those responsible for committing violence need to be investigated for their acts of domestic terrorism. Now, do I think it's a coincidence that that came out and a couple days later a supposed shooter regresses into a Planned Parenthood after shooting people outside and five and a half hours later the media comes out and says that an official source told them that he said no more baby parts? That's a damn fishy situation. I mean, I, I believe in faith. I believe in instances, but coincidences are something else. I, I don't disagree with everything that Aaron just said. I mean, I think there's lots of reasons to question this sort of official narrative. But I mean, wasn't there actual additional evidence? I mean, I believe his ex-wife said that he once put glue in the locks of a Planned Parenthood near the house they were living. I think there was some connection to the Army of God, which is... Actually, no, 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 there wasn't. There wasn't? You're right about the first thing, which is... One ex-wife said, yeah, he didn't like abortion, but he never talked about it. Another said he had glued the locks of a Planned Parenthood down south, and there's no other connection like that. I don't think, although, you know, it well, is worth I mean, noting that it's, this guy, I mean, like, I don't know how much you should litigate this. This is a guy who lived in a shanty yeah, yeah. off-grid and does and believed Satan was controlling his thoughts. Right. I'm not entirely sure this is something where you try to litigate, uh, you know, right. everything he said. Yeah, and, and, and the thing is... Uh, it's not the Planned Parenthood, the NARAL stuff. I mean, the thing is, any time anything happens anywhere near a Planned Parenthood or other abortion clinic, it is there's a big deal made out of it. Even if it turns out later that it was arson done for insurance reasons or whatever, you know, we never that that never gets factored into the the stats at the end of the day. Um, but it is true that there there is violence. Well, not just the inherent violence that happens in an abortion clinic, but all these other things that happen around it. So all of this could have just been because they were basically uh, assuming that something would happen that they could use uh, to advance this other part of their agenda. Yeah, let's, go, let's go to Neil. We haven't heard from Neil in a while. Oh, 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 well, no, no, no. well, let me just, Molly, I mean, let me just Molly, ask a quick I'm, question here. Now, 
are the are the official records still sealed? The police, the authorities yes. haven't released anything yeah. that would actually confirm or deny any of this. Yeah, let me let me let me speak on that. It. Let me because, speak on that. Uh, honestly, I think it's a I think it's a bit of a waste of time uh, for everybody to to indulge these theories when we when there's there's clearly evidence that exists. Well, let's wait for it to come out. But I mean, I understand, of course, that you know while we could personally be disciplined about that. Our our friends on the left feel no such right. uh, duty. Right, and, and here's here's the thing. Now, um, I I want to just speak on this because Leon can attest to the fact that I've been in contact with the Colorado Springs Police Department, the Public Information Office, and the Joint Information Center that they set up for this event. And um, the the following morning after I read that Wesley Lowry article, um, I not only did I contact um, the CSP uh, PD PIO office. Um, but I asked them multiple questions about what was going on. I asked them whether or not they can confirm or deny uh, the report of no more baby parts. They couldn't. And they also ended up going online and tweeting out that any speculation on motive could end up – this is after my call – that any speculation on motive could end up hurting the investigation and that the only official information would come from their Twitter account and from, from the CSPD PIO. So – that's the first thing. The next thing is I asked them uh, some basic general questions that I would ask about anybody who was arrested after a shooting. Um, did you do a talk screen on this person? Did you do a psych evaluation on this person? Did you do this? Did you do that? Did you th do this? Um, they wouldn't confirm any of that, but I can tell you just by knowing the process and knowing people who work in the police department here and also in the county sheriff's department uh, where he's actually being held, um, I can tell you that suicide vest that's on him, they don't put suicide vests on prisoners just because, okay? They put suicide well, on guy... vests... They, they put suicide vests on prisoners because they've they've displayed that they're uh, a harm to themselves or a harm to others, and they also put them in a special ward for that, and they have to go through a process to get them in there, and it all starts with a psych screen or a talk screen showing that they had to be put in there. So that's something yeah, people to, should Just to consider. clarify, this is a... This is a... Uh, suicide prevention vest, not a yeah, uh, not jihadi a, version right. of a suicide vest. Right? <laughs> so, yeah, oh, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> See, I, I, you can tell, like, within two words, they start talking that they're not right in the head. There are some people, all you have to do is see a still photo, and you know this is someone who's not right in the head. And Robert Deere qualifies for that. For anybody in the history yes. of mankind ever has. Well, so, he, what do he, you got? he looks like, he oh, looks like I, Nick I, Nolte when he got arrested. Yeah. <laughs> but, 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 but again, <laughs> But again, this speaks to what we were saying earlier about it is amazing to look at when the media is just freely speculating about motive based on dodgy evidence and when they decide, whoa, 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 we need to urge caution. You know, again, the contrast between the shooting in San Bernardino where, you know, they are, you know, the, I think Reuters had an article today about how Muslims fear uh, backlash uh, in the wake of this attack. I mean, can you imagine Reuters writing an article, pro-lifers feel backlash in the wake of you know Colorado attacks? It just it would never happen. I mean, the contrast between these things is, is so dramatic. It's just it's no, just go ahead. Now, I, I I just wanted to say that I, I thought Molly brought up a very interesting point before when she talked about you know how he felt like he was possessed by the devil. And Aaron, I I, I think that actually kind of refute some of your theories uh, because if he was possessed by the devil at the time that could explain why he killed the pro-life cop and let the abortionist live it makes total sense that's true uh, <laughs> oh I did it just to annoy joy <laughs> anyway uh, also and more importantly and if, if we're being days, serious here I, I just wanted to point out that what is that thing on Neil's head it once was alive <laughs> but now dead he looks ready to jam and show off his glam. At long last, he looks different from Ted. That is a limerick. <laughs> is, that a play? is that Brent Cochran? No, that's Night of the Right. Oh, that's I, uh, great. I celebrate that limerick. I appreciate it. Game respect game, as they say. <laughs> and Mark and Molly, if you don't understand, we have a, we have a, a tradition now of our, our followers sending in um, vulgar limericks insulting us. And so there you go. No, 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 no. It's it's not us. It's generally just Joy Behar over here. Um, <laughs> it's, that, that's that, a sound. That, that is an insult. That's the thing. You, that's the I, thing I you appreciate just the effort that went into that. I really and genuinely do. Anytime I can be insulted with a little right. bit of verve, I uh, take it as a, as a compliment. 
Can can I leave can I leave you with one one thought here, Leo, on, on this uh, this uh, narrow letter to the attorney general? I, I want to quote this one other thing that they say uh, they want these crimes to be uh, domestic terrorism under Title eighteen of the United States Code, Section two two three three one, and uh, they uh, they say that uh, these attacks also continue uh, should be continued to be investigated under the Face Act. 18 U.S.C. Section 248, and the Federal Stalking Statute, 18 U.S.C. Section 2261 Alpha 1, and RICO. So basically the fact that all, uh, what is it, seven of us here just spoke about Planned Parenthood being butchers, um, we could be brought up on RICO charges. So uh, check with your lawyers. Well, hey, uh, hey I, I'm remember, a rhino, so I'm off the hook. Well, remember... Sheldon Whitehouse, a sitting U.S. senator uh, um, earlier this year, advocated RICO statutes be applied to global warming deniers. I yep. mean, it's, it's, it's bananas. So let me go to Jeff, and, and, and maybe Mark and Molly can chime in on this as well. This is probably the last question that we're going to have time to, to, to get to. I think, I think uh, Eric Erickson made a, made a really compelling point the day after the, um, the most recent shooting, the San Bernardino shooting. Is that today? Holy crap, it has been a long day. So, it's so yesterday, yeah, it was, but it feels like today. Well, today's the day after, right? Yes. 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 So, yes. so today, this morning. So he made a really interesting point, which was that in the first two hours um, after this this shooting was uh, reported, and it seemed at that time like, well, here's a guy who got pissed off at his holiday party, went home, shot it up. You, you look at the tweets from liberals on Twitter, and they were immediately blaming it on right-wing political ideology. Right. Whereas the right people on the right side of Twitter were immediately assuming here is either a crazy person or a foreign terrorist. So if you look at here's here's the two differences in the assumptions that people make when a shooting like this happens before the facts come in. Leftists initially their initial assumption is that it was an American who disagreed with them over a mainstream political view like abortion. People on the right assume it's a crazy person or a foreign terrorist. I mean, what does that say about the mindset of where we are as a country and, I guess, the health of our body politic as we go forward? It says nothing good, and what it absolutely does say is that we're all back in the corners. You know, it's funny because um, Mark Caputo, who is uh, you know, a friend, a friend of you know, other podcasts I do, he, he writes for Politico. He's a really good Florida reporter. He made this exact in, in, in other night. words, you've never met him, but you're name dropping no, him. No, no, this is important. This is important because he made the <laughs> exact Twitter point friend. last night. No, 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 no. Bill, shut the fuck up for one second. He said, "At what point did the left and the right trade sides on social media with regards to crowing about the, the various sources of this?" And my response, and that he agreed with me, is, "Is the minute a Muslim name emerged, and." And, it, and and I even admitted as much myself. I mean, I'm well, I'm no angel. I said the same thing early on. As like you know, it's kind of sad how much all of us uh, factions on either side have writing on the fact of the motive on this case. Because let's not kid ourselves. Had this been like a neo-Nazi, I know people who've talked to me, you know, in conservative publications who said like, oh man. If this turns out to be like you know a right winger or like a white supremacist, I've done another Dylan Roof. In other words, that man, this could be bad for gun control. This could be a real big problem. And then same other people were saying to me, man, if this is an Islamist terrorism, we can really stick it to so and so. And that just tells me that we have reached a point, a pathetic point in our political discourse where we are all just looking to get into our corners. And I don't even object to it because I feel the same way. I absolutely agree, because the, I, in my opinion, they have chosen to do this, and I am only responding. If they are going to play that game, but then it, it, it's uh, it's game theory, tit for tat. If they're going to do it, you're a fool to not play back at them. Right. So I was, frankly, you know, happy in a weird way to find out that it wasn't just some right-wing activist or something like that, like the Planned Parenthood, but potentially Je thing Jeff, in Colorado. Jeff, you're absolutely right, and I agree with everything you're saying, and I'll try and wrap this up quickly, but but uh, um, 
it, let's be clear here. It's not tit for tat. I mean, maybe we're all searching for our corners and our own little political advantages, but it's incredibly asymmetric. Sure. Oh, I, I um, totally agree. In terms of the double standard here, I mean, again and again, we see this situation where they're blaming right-wing ideology. Like, for instance, the Holocaust shooter, I'll give you a good example. Here was a guy who was a neo-Nazi, and everybody went out and blamed the right. This guy had a massive hatred for organized religion, and you know what he had in his glove compartment? The Weekly Standards address. I was in the office that day that he shot the Holocaust Museum and may well have gone to where I was and shot me. Okay, right. And to say that this is a product of right-wing ideology is to grossly oversimplify the way a lot of these things happen. They say the same thing. Remember the guy that slammed his plane into the IRS building in Texas? Right. That guy was, like, everyone said he was a right-winger, but he was He's a Marxist. A communist manifesto in his, his, his letter behind him. Eric Rudolph, the abortion clinic bomber, went out and said, I prefer Nietzsche to the Bible. And again, you know, Christians were blamed. You know, uh, um, it's just... You know, these issues are far more complex in terms of ideology than they are painted to be because the media wants them to serve certain political narratives. And but, but, but the thing is, is that they have been weaponized. I didn't want this. You didn't want this. None of us wanted this. But it happened. And yeah. at this point, I do not deny. I am not going to be. I'm not a pacifist, okay? I, I simply accept the fact that if they're going to play this game against us, then I, I, I spent the entire night last night saying, let's not draw conclusions. Okay, Fareed Sayuk, or whatever the guy's name is, let's not jump to conclusions. Maybe it really was workplace violence. But the minute that it turned out, yeah, we know now, it was terrorism, okay? At that, that point, I'm going to shift my calculus. Because Lord knows, they would not let me off the hook. And well, I'm not sure this to be disingenuous. It's because there's actually a real point I want to prove, and a real point to make. It's not just about bickering for partisan advantage. But you're right. I will not lie. There is a part of me that actually does say to myself, you know, they would they would burn me at the stake on this if it had been like an anti-abortion protester. Remember that that Bloomberg tweet? We Molly, I know Molly, you you had a great tweet on it. I did the same thing about it. That like they said last yesterday when it was like still breaking news. Oh, only you know this shooting happened two miles from a Planned Parenthood as it was happening. I'm like. Holy fuck! I'm sorry to curse, but whoa! Dude, that's so in other right. words, way Jeff. out of range of any gun that's ever been invented. Right. Je this, Jeff, this, uh, Jeff, uh, Jeff, listen, I, I had a guy arguing with me after I posted the map, and he was saying, oh, it's only 11, 1,100 yards. And I'm like, okay, 1,100 yards. And I think, I think it was actually you, Mark, who retweeted and said something to the effect of, who was it, Chris Kyle taking the shot? I was going to say, uh, American Sniper couldn't have hit that shot. Right, I mean, exactly. On. It's insane. Okay, and and I, they, they kept on, they kept on trying to say, you know, oh, he traveled, he traveled, he could have traveled right over to the Planned Parenthood. There's the Santa Ana River there, and even though it's pretty dry, it's still got, you know, nine foot high uh, banks on each side that you got to climb up and climb over, and then you got to get through a whole entire golf course to get there. It was, it was Claim that it had anything to do with Planned Parenthood, especially after they shamed and mocked everyone who noted, who simply noted that this other shooting in Colorado Springs happened near a right. Chase Bank, when it's literally wow. 200 yards or less between the Chase Bank and the and the Planned Parenthood door to door. Right, let's close. Molly, let's what, what was the thing let's you were going to say? Molly. We're way I over just, time. I just think it's important that even if other people are very uncivil with each other that we don't behave that way and I, I know that might be a losing game in terms of politics but it is never I've never been poorly served by waiting for facts to come out before talking about the implications of a crime and I think it really it, it's there's plenty of time to talk about political answers to various social problems that are out there and I don't think contributing to the lack of civil discourse is a good approach. I mean, this is, we're in a really bad place with the way we talk to each other, and it's very sad that people can't have just differences of opinion on topics and talk them out. And, um, you know, we can get confused because there's so many bad people on Twitter, but I'm not sure if that's actually representative of the country at large. And I think we should really work hard to seize that civil space where we can have conversations even as we have these very major disagreements. I just want to add, I just want to add that I'd be so much worse of a person if I wasn't married to this woman. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that, that's true for all of us who are married, right? 
Uh, yeah. I, I want to, on, on Molly's scary. point, can, uh, on Molly's point, I want to just also note, um, here in Colorado Springs, when that uh, event happened, all the media who were, who were actually down there on the ground reporting, they were amazing people. All of them were really good. Um, none of them were impugning motives of anybody or anything or, you know, anything. So um, much, much respect for the guys who were on the grounds running the cameras and actually picking up microphones and doing stuff. But, y well, you, know, you know how it is. The, the people the people in the D.C.'s heads, um, you know, they're a little different sometimes. Well, I have, I have concerns, and this is something, you know, we've touched on a number of times in this show before. And, you know, um, you know, the missus and I were having a conversation about this today, and we'll close with this thought, you know, thinking about, you know, our daughter that we have who's five months old. I, I think social media is, is, you know, there's a lot of ways in which it's incredible, and there's a lot of ways in which it makes all of our relationships just infinitely worse. And I think about what, what is going to be like when she... 15 years from now dates. I mean, is that even going to be a thing that occurs? I mean, with all the Tinder and stuff that we have now, I mean, are teenagers going to, like, go on dates with each other? Or what is even... And it's a frightening thing, maybe, you know, this is my old man creeping through. It's scary to me to even contemplate such a world knowing the extent to which people feel free on social media to say, you know, t terrible and horrendous things to and about, you know, me who don't know me, they don't know anything about my family, and you know what, I laugh it off because I, I, it comes kind of comes with the job that I've assumed, but, you know, it's um, it's it's depressing, and, and I don't know if, uh, you know, if, if it's going to be something, that's a trend that's going to reverse, but we can, it's something that we can all hope for, uh, and, and, I, and I hope that it'll, I think that it'll maybe take something more than maybe all of us being nicer to one another on Twitter, I think it's going to take a major cultural shift that, that I don't know that we're prepared for yet. Um, but hopefully it'll happen someday in the future. So with that, we're going to close up. Thank you guys so much for, for listening in. I want to thank my panelists for being here. Thanks, Neil doing the Federalist, uh, for coming in, uh, hung over from New Orleans. Thank you, Neil, for being here with us. Jeff it Blake. was my sincere pleasure. I, I don't believe that. Uh, Jeff Blair, the Ace of Spades Decision Desk. Thank you, Jeff, for being here. F. Bill McMorris so of the Washington Free Beacon. <laughs> Um, you just, we, 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 we just did an entire we just we process. just did an entire show about shooting, and then you linked it to people being mean on Twitter to you. <laughs> That's right. It's they're they're roughly equivalent. You, roughly you're, equivalent. You're more millennial right. than I am. What do, you, what, do you, what do you think? What do you think happened to Bill's arm? I mean, yeah, you know. that's right. Apparently, he lost a fight. He lost a football game <laughs> with his three-year-old and got injured in the process. I won. I won the football game. I just happened <laughs> to throw a million interceptions. Defense yeah. wins championships. And also broke his three-year-old's arm as well. So uh, we also thanks Mark and Molly Hemingway, Weekly Standard, and the Federalists. Thank you guys so much for being with us. Appreciate your contributions as well. Thank you, the audience. Glad you've been with us. We gave you some bonus video today. And we'll be back next week on the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Friends.